Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Welcome back to the Equip Me and Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm I'm the host for the Equip Me and Grace podcast. And today I have Garrett with me. Garrett, welcome to the Equip Me and Grace podcast, my friend. Hey, Dave, great uh, great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, it's great to have you. Can you uh, just let us know a little bit about your life, marriage, ministry, and what ministry projects are you working on? Yeah, great. I am. Uh, yeah, first and foremost. Uh, Follower of Jesus, I've known the Lord for about 21 years. He rescued me mercifully during my time in college, and uh, I just recently crossed the halfway point of being a Christian longer than I was a non-Christian. So I'm um, still in progress, but I'm thankful for His grace. I have one wife. Her name is Carrie. Uh, we have, uh, well, six kids. One is about to show up. Um, Carrie's due in in July, uh, but we have uh, five with us right now. And um, yeah, I serve as a pastor at Delray Baptist Church, which is outside of uh, Washington, D.C. in Alexandria, Virginia. I've been there for about nine years. And uh, yeah, the Lord continues to work in the midst of our mess. And uh, we're thankful for that. He is good. Our people are yeah, leaning upon him imperfectly, but with filled with hope. Uh, so yeah, but I'm, uh, yeah, appreciate uh, the time with you. Yeah. Praise God, man. Uh, awesome. And, uh, I've enjoyed a few of your articles at TGC and other nine marks. So keep up the good work you're doing there too. Thanks for the encouragement, brother. Yes, sir. Well, can you uh, tell us about your book, Pure in Heart, Sexual Sin and the Promises of God, why you wrote it and how you hope it'll be received? Sure. Yeah. So this book is really birthed out of just a lot of things the Lord has done in my life over the years. Um, the The short answer is I'm a pastor and I want to help other people follow Jesus. And sexual sin is not the only sin that people struggle with, but it is one that seems to be ever present, both in the lives of brothers and sisters. Um, and I know there's been a lot of good resources that are out there, but for whatever reason, I didn't feel like there was one that I could always hand to just anybody and say, Hey, listen, wherever you are, whether you are uh, yeah, a man or a woman, whether you are, um, you know, actively struggling with this sin or whether you're trying to help somebody else struggle, uh, with this sin. Well, I didn't feel like I had a resource that I could just hand them that I was, I felt was accessible for everybody. So this is written, um, yeah, as a, as somebody who needs Jesus' help to then help other people to follow Jesus in this all important area. So it's aimed at the whole church, um, has a strong emphasis on, um, the importance of, of the church as a, as a body helping one another. And uh, yeah, so my prayer is that it will, yeah, it'll help people love Jesus more to see that he is more precious than anything that, uh, yeah, sin or Satan could ever offer and that it will help them um, practically to know how to fight against uh, the temptations that seem to abound at, at every turn. Yeah, I think it's a it's a really helpful book. And the, and you're right, in the literature in this particular subject, there's there's not something really, there are books that you can hand to people, but, you know, a, a, a real uh, helpful resource that covers the whole total a little bit more on the mm-hmm. topic is definitely needed. And we need more books like that on this topic too. So I appreciate mm-hmm. you writing it, brother. Yeah. No, it's uh, it was a labor of love. Had a lot of help. Uh, I've had brothers and sisters. Um, actually, I mean, it was a it was originally. I thought, you know, if it gets published, fine. But I wrote it first and foremost for our church. And so before I sent it off to uh, to to Crossway, we actually had a reading group of about eighty brothers and sisters uh, read through it together in small groups um, and talk through it. And they helped make it even better, just giving good feedback on things that either were distracting or that could have been all the more helpful. So I'm grateful for for those brothers and sisters that had. Their, their fingerprints on it as well. Those are uh, those are the best books, you know, when they're written in the local church and community, asking other people to walk alongside of you. Those are those are the best books, in my opinion. So excellent. Okay. excellent. What uh, what outside forces wage war in our pursuit of purity? Yeah, so certainly outside forces do. I think even before we start there, we should talk about the internal forces, right? So we have a heart that is deceitfully wicked above all things. So my greatest enemy is not what's out there, but it's what's in here. There's a you know, as, as John Owen would talk about a traitor inside the gate, 
um, and that our hearts need help. And first and foremost, you know, uh, this is why we need to be we need to be born again. This is why Christ came to live a perfect life, unlike the one that we've lived, to die the death that we deserve, to rise from the dead, to then give His Spirit so that we can be born again and we can be given a a new heart that loves God more than it loves sin. Because naturally, we just we love sin. We want sin. Not everybody appetite looks the same in regards to what what their you know, sin of choice is, but everybody wants that. Um, so we need a new heart. And that's that's good news that Jesus gives us a, a new heart. But we still have our abiding flesh. And this is why we need, we need promises from God to pull our heart and minds upward to him. So this is really what the whole book is, is, is based on, is the promise that Jesus gives us in Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So the first thing, even before we talk about external like forces that work against us, you got to realize that the whole, that the battle for purity is not just to, to be pure as an, as an end in itself, but rather it is a means to an end. Purity is a means to an end. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We get to see God. So that's a heart change sort of thing to begin. So internally, we need to be born again. And then internally, we need promises from God to move our hearts and woo our hearts and warm our affections upward toward him to see him as the great treasure. That's going to help me to fight pornography or temptation with a boyfriend or girlfriend much more than just don't do it or you're in trouble. Like that only works so much, um, you know, so now that being said, your question is a great one, right? So in Ephesians chapter two, we get this, this picture of the three great enemies of, of all people um, and believers now have eyes on it, that we have the, the world, the flesh and the devil, I think is how it's oftentimes talked about. And that's the first three verses of Ephesians uh, chapter two. And basically what each of those are so the the the, the let's start with uh, the flesh. So that is the our um, that that part of us that still loves sin, even though we're born again. There's still a part of us that is fallen and is affected by the the curse of sin. That still is like a magnet for all of the things that are fleeting and that are dishonoring to God. Right. So we have our, our sinful flesh, which, again, not everybody's appetite for sin is the same thing, but it's always oriented at fleeting pleasures that are you know, dishonoring to God. Then we have our, our great enemy, who is Satan. He is a you know, fallen angelic being who hates God and hates image bearers of God and does anything he can through scheming and through temptation and attacks when given permission by God to yeah, just to harm and to distract us from seeing God. Uh, his chief aim is for us to not see Jesus. Second uh, Corinthians talk about that, that he wants to blind the minds of unbelievers so they won't see the glory of Christ. So his whole thing is, how can we cover up eyes from seeing Jesus? And the way he does that primarily is through the world system. So the world is not like the planet that we live on. That's that's true, but that's not what the Bible means when it says world. The world is a, a system, a spiritual system set up by Satan designed to cater to our sinful flesh so that our affections will be drawn downward away from God and toward the things that are, you know, um, that, that are, that are again, fleeting and enjoyable for the moment. But then Satan always hides the price tag, right? He never tells you what cost you, um, both in joy and in peace and in all of the things that we're actually seeking after when we're, we're chasing after sin. So those external forces of the world, the flesh, and the, the devil are what are what we're always warring against as, as Christians. But the good news is we have his spirit and we have his promises, and that fuels our obedience and faith so that we can trust Jesus and keep following him in the midst of all of the mess. Yeah, I appreciate what you the how you answer that, especially the start of how you answer that, because it's you know, we can get that wrong. We can focus so much on the practical strategies. Okay, this is what's causing me to do this. It's like actually what you need is what you just said. We need the gospel. We have to go back to the gospel. And we need yeah. the gospel all the time. As Piper said, you know, we're held we're held fast by the gospel down to the nanosecond. Yeah. And uh, J.C. Ryle talked about that. Martin Lloyd-Jones, um, you know, we, we need the gospel. We need it all the time. We don't need it just sometime after we get saved. We need it, you know, all the time and everywhere in between in our, in our Christian life. So. Yeah, we, we, we never graduate from being broken, desperate, needy sinners who need God's help. Like he's, we, we never, that doesn't stop when you get born again. We, we still need him every hour, as the old hymn would say. Amen, brother. Well, you use phrases such as we feed the beast and you are what you eat throughout the book in regards to sexual sin. Can you kind of flush that out for us? Yeah, so that one of those enemies, the the flesh, um, yeah, I want us to help think about it as 
in, in regards to how are we being influenced, right? So, so um, feeding the beast, the image I use is, um, is that, that our, our sinful flesh is like an, it's like a, 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 a beast that if you feed it, it gets stronger. I think the image I actually use in the book is of a sumo wrestler. So I say that if you, you know, if you're going to, if you know in one month that you are going to fight um, maybe as a sumo wrestler or an MMA fighter, I forget which one I use, but Either way, you're going to fight this world champion fighter in a month. And the deal is that you get to pick his diet for the next month. And, and I ask the question, what, what would you feed him? And I hope the answer is nothing. Uh, you're going to starve him because you want him as weak as possible. So when you step in the ring, you don't get lit up, right? Well, in the same way, our sinful flesh, we need to starve it to not be nibbling on the little offerings of the world that 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 weaken, that grieve the spirit, that quench the spirit. And that strengthen our flesh, but rather we want to starve the um, our sinful flesh by not giving into all the sorts of temptations, which that's another theme that I bring out in the book is that oftentimes we get so fixated on, I want to be pure. I want to fight sexual sin. I want to not look at pornography. I want to not masturbate. I want to not give in in this relationship in regards to, to sin that we forget that there's 10,000 other things that are going on in our life. So discontentment and impatience and grumbling and ungratefulness and pride and envy and jealousy. And you could 10,000 other things. If we're yeah. giving into those temptations, right? It's strengthening our sinful flesh. And if sexual sin is kind of our weak point, that's going to be where it's going to show up most. Um, so we want to talk. Yeah. That's, that, that's where I, I, I talk about in the book in regards to, 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 to not feeding our sinful flesh, but then we also have the, um, the need to feed the spirit. Now that, the, you know, the scriptures don't speak about it exactly like that, but we want to, we want to not sow to the flesh, we want to sow to the spirit. That's more biblical language where by prayer, by, and I mean like real prayer, where we go before the Lord and pleading, fasting, like Lord, cutting things out so that we can seek the Lord intention, his word, music, creation. Like there's so many things that we be diligent in pursuing. So holiness is not just what you don't do, but it's also what you pursue, you know? So, so flee these things. And then pursue these things, Paul would tell uh, Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, right? Um, so flee youthful lusts and pursue righteousness. So we want to have a, a diet of both. Um, just similarly to if you're going to change how you're eating, you're going to stop eating junk food and you're going to start eating healthy food, um, which, you know, initially is not so fun. But over time, even your palate changes and what you desire. And you're not going to want to go and indulge in, in unhealthy food. You're going to want the good stuff. And that's, we want to change our appetites because in that sense, we are what we eat. We want to sow to the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's really, 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 really quite helpful. Um, you know, and it's, again, it's not just, okay, do this and then you'll somehow achieve victory. It's again, like you just said, even there again, it's because of Christ. It's because of what he has done in our hearts through his finished and sufficient work. And uh, because we've been born again, uh, we can, you know, fight against the world, the flesh and the devil. We have the indwelling presence of the, of the Holy spirit and he is our helper and he'll help us to help always provide a way of escape uh, That's right. out, out, out of this. Uh, and we have to take that way of escape when it, sure. when it comes, you know, not just entertain it and dance around it and um those kind of things so what you what said is really really good you know i know brother i've i've dealt with men who have struggled with this a lot and i know that a lot of them think I'm, i might be beyond redemption i i I'm so stuck in this uh um they might even wonder am i a christian um so they might feel like they're totally beyond redemption what encouragement do you have for someone with that mindset yeah i think both brothers and sisters can can feel that way and oftentimes sisters it's even more difficult because there's a, an added element of of shame so everybody has shame over sin but for whatever reason in the church, we've not done a good job typically of, of, of highlighting the fact that, you know, sexual temptation is something that, that, that our sisters get snared in um, just as easily oftentimes. So any believer, I think who feels that way, I think the first thing we want to say is, well, I mean, I don't always just assume somebody's a Christian. So we do want to talk about, Hey, where are you with the Lord? But if indeed somebody is born again and they are just ensnared um, and they're feeling despair, I think the good news is to remember that, 
that Jesus does not come for the healthy people. He comes for sick people. Like he comes for people who need his help. And how many, you know, how much of the scriptures are filled with pictures of the prodigal son who's off at the pig's trough, you know? I mean, and then he needs to, he comes to his senses by God's grace and he, he has a place to run to. Jesus said, if you're weary and heavy laden, come to me, I'll give you rest, right? So, I mean, there's, the, the good news is that Jesus only deals with, with, with people who are messed up. He doesn't have any perfect children. Amen. Now, I, I do think it's important to recognize when we feel this way is just how, how bad sin is for you, how unloving Satan is. I mean, Satan shows his true colors. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And it's, it's just like somebody who's been hooked on drugs, and you can just see it. I mean, that was a part of my past. I saw so many friends who just, their lives just riddled, just ate their bodies up. It just stole from them. And oftentimes, the same sort of effects are happening to people with giving into sexual sin. It's just this stealing life from them. So I think we need to say, hey, sin has not been good to me. So I'm going to I'm gonna renounce it. I'm going to lean upon God. I'm going to trust his promises that say in, in Romans chapter six, we don't, we're not slaves to sin. We, we don't have to sin anymore. Uh, and I'm not teaching a perfectionism gospel, but I'm just saying like, Romans 6 says you're dead to sin and you don't have to do what you used to do because you're not who you used to be, that you're alive with Christ and by his spirit, you can now walk in the newness of life. And there's, there's good news here. And the good news is that if somebody's even on the couch talking about that, this is great news. Like that means, you know, you need help. So let's, let's, you know, and oftentimes when somebody starts there, I'm be like, okay, let's start real practical. How are you accessing sin? What does it look like? And if this is like a pornography issue, I'd be like, okay, are you ready to do whatever it takes? If so, let's dumb down your phone so much that um, you can't get to pornography. So right now, if you put a gun to my head, um, that's my wife, Carrie. Uh, if you, if you, nice. put, uh, Good picture, uh, brother. thanks. If, if you put a gun to my head and said, pull up a pornographic image, I couldn't, I literally couldn't. My phone is so dumbed down um, that I, I could not access a pornographic picture. There's ways to do that. Now, when people, when you start talking about what that costs to cut out certain apps and to, you know, delete some of this and that, you can see people have a visible, like a visible reaction sometimes. And that's where Jesus said, it's better for you to lose an eye. It's better for you to lose a hand than to lose your soul. Right. So if, if Jesus said, you got to cut off your hand to not sin, he at least meant you can delete some apps. Um, you know, <laughs> people, believe it or not, people live for thousands of years without smartphones, thousands of them. Um, and we, we can too, if that's what we need to do. So I, I want to say, first thing we need to do is get radical about our sin. Um, and, and let's do whatever we need to do to cut off the inflow. And then let's get some people around you who love you, and are going to walk with you. I'm going to ask you honest questions. And then let's really dig in. And I just want you to know that, that Jesus can help you. And the fact that you're even here having this conversation shows he's not done with you. So let's lean on him together and let's go. And God does change people and he can change people. Great answer, brother. And I love that you're, you're even earlier, you were saying, at, telling people, ask lots of questions with those who are enslaved to pornography, or maybe even for women, it's romance novels or something else. Uh, that's so helpful. And because it's a, a communication to the person, hey, I'm not just going to preach at you. I want to actually dig in, as you said, and find out what I call this, the that's a biblical counseling approach, asking good questions, finding out the history, finding out some struggles, because like you were talking about earlier, there could be uh, family issues that might have been a cause, or there might be current stress points that you're, they're not aware of that are causing these things. And and part of the battle for pornography, and you you shared uh, about that, you know, for I know myself coming out of a, a enslavement to pornography is uh, I had to realize, become more self-aware. It, uh, of what was causing this about the history of the things that caused it. And uh, that, that helped me to, to, you know, come out of it and realize, Hey, this is really all just selfish. Self mm -hmm. is on the throne. The flesh is trying to rule. And uh, that uh, the Holy spirit used that to convict me and penetrate my, into my heart and to show me that how, just how ugly and um, ugly, it, how ugly it is and how beautiful Christ is. And There's so, um, yeah, that's, that's great, brother. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're, I think you're right on that. Um, not everybody's 
contributing factors are going to be the same, but this is where, you know, the answer is always the same, which is Jesus, but the ways that we are and needing to get to dig into maybe some past history and also present practices, things that, that need to be exposed to help untangle sin, that's just going to be unique for everybody. And that's why there's no one size fits all sort of answer the other than Jesus. Now, how Jesus is going to minister to you uniquely, uh, I think it's important. So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's really good. Well, I know you were just talking about smartphones and those kind of things. What advice do you have for men and women struggling with the their use of Instagram and, and further their use of their cell phones when it comes to purity? Um, well, I, I think that the first thing I would say is just to remember, um, let's go back to, to someone I was talking about again, that the, the pornography is not the only thing. So the only the only problem with the, with the smartphone is, or, well, We'll say it this way. Pornography is not the only problem with a smartphone. Instagram is not the only problem. It's it's being tethered to this, right? This this idea of I'm, you know, when you get those little reports to bet your screen time, you're like, oh, man, that's that's not <laughs> uh, you're abiding in your cell phone. Mm. You're, you're abiding in communication and information and alerts and whatever it is that you're looking at, you're abiding in it. Mm. And Jesus says, you got to abide in me. And that if you don't abide in me, you're not going to bear fruit. And if you don't bear fruit, you're not going to have joy. And this is like, this Ooh. is, so Jesus <laughs> says, you, you're looking here and the, this thing trained, you're, it's designed to keep your attention on it. That's why, I mean, the colors are uniquely tweaked in order to get your attention. Apps send you alerts to keep you tied in. You have messages. And I mean, this is, it's designed to draw you in to abide. So you've got to understand that this has got to just be a tool rather than a, a tether to life. If you're looking for life on this thing, you're in trouble. Mm. And that's, that's, I mean, all of the things, I mean, that this thing is designed to do, you've got to understand that Satan has purposes in that as well. Now I have one, so I'm really clear. I'm not saying you could just, I'm not the, you know, burn your TV guy. Um, <laughs> but maybe you need to burn your TV. You might need to. So if you can't have a smartphone and follow Jesus, then get rid of your smartphone. It's, it's okay. You Amen. will live like you just will. Now you might not be able to live with it though. And that's a real thing. And that, that, that requires humility to be able to say, you know what? I don't think I'm spiritually mature enough to be able to have that phone. So for instance, I don't have uh, on that phone, um, Twitter, for instance, I use Twitter on my, um, on my, 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 com my computer, but I don't, I don't have it on there. Um, not only because I don't want temptation towards sexual sin, but because I'm tempted to just be tuned in there all the time, getting updates and seeing who said what that's not healthy for me because it, it, it keeps me everywhere other than where I am, you know? And so one of the things we're trying to implement in our house is screens down when humans are around. Um, like, because otherwise we're just all just not paying attention to each other. So I say all of that to say, just remember that it's not just avoiding pornography on this thing. It's re realizing that this just sows to your flesh of immediate gratification. The whole thing is like, you know, right now, if I wanted Chinese food, I could hit Uber Eats, hit something else, and it could be here before we're done, probably. That's not really how spiritual growth works. Everything in this world is, is exactly the opposite of the way God works. God works slowly, methodically, patiently, you know, <laughs> Yeah. through conversation, through all of that. So first things first is just, that's my whole spiel on, on, on smartphones. Anyway, that's that being said, also, I, I think, yeah, there are some apps that you can't, you just can't have. I think you, I can't have, I know me, I can't have, and they're not good for your soul. So if, if you find yourself continually um, being tempted to search a hashtag or to, to, to follow somebody or to message somebody or whatever it may be, you just got to delete the app. And I have it set up to where like a, like a, like my team, like my kids, <laughs> if they want an app, they have to request it. If I want an app, I have to go to one of my other pastors, Chris over there, uh, or I got to ask my wife and I'll tell her, I'm like, sorry, you're married to a you know 12 year old, but can you do this so I can download an app? Like I, I can't just download them because I don't trust myself. I just know me. So I think it requires some, mm. you know, some, some humility to be able to say, I'm, I'm not able to handle this well. Um, yeah. And, and I think this is where you don't want to do that alone. So have other people in with you, helping you think through that and just be willing to do whatever it takes. Uh, in order to, to to follow the Lord. Well, I think you just said something. We said a lot of things are really good, but in particular, you just said that, you know, you to download the app, you know, you have to talk to your to your pastor or your fellow pastor and your wife. Um, so maybe you could touch on that, uh, what that accountability looks like for you, you know, those yeah. kind of things. I have, you know, before when I was ensnared in, 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 in 
particularly pornography, um, there was a bit of, <clears throat> I had shielded myself from real accountability. So one of the things that I've learned in life is to surround myself with people who love me, but are not impressed with me. My wife loves me, but she's just not impressed with me. <laughs> yes. Jason, Ben, those are the three guys who really kind of keep me accountable. They love me, but they are just not impressed with me. And that is so helpful because they're more worried about me making it to heaven than me having any kind of notoriety or platform or anything stupid like that. Like they just want me to be a Christian. They want me to love God and love my family and love neighbors. And like, that's, that's, that's the most important thing. Right. So it's dangerous to be alone. Um, yeah. And so this is why being a part of a healthy local church with a gospel community, not just gospel preaching, that's essential, but a gospel community that goes with it is really, really important where Everybody knows that we're all struggling, trying to trying to follow Jesus together. So I have people who know me, like they have a pulse on me. So right now, if you asked Chris and Ben and Jason, those are my three guys right now. If you ask them, how's Garrett doing? They should be able to give you, I think, a fairly accurate assessment of where my soul is this week. I'm, I mean, we, we are, we are tethered in, they know me same kind of thing with my wife. She knows how my soul's doing. Um, I have, um, apps on my phone and on my, um, my computer that, you know, monitor what I watch, uh, what I look at and they're all on my reports. So anything that I'm, I'm looking at, um, is, you know, is, is accountable and that, that that's hugely helpful. Um, so yeah, I have a uh, regular conversations. Um, I, I have a group text, so I'm, I'm generally morally opposed to group texts. Uh, but, um, I, I have a, I have a couple of them. And one of them is with those three guys where we'll send memes and different funny stuff and this and that, but regularly on there say, Hey, I'm feeling tempted right now. Would you pray for me? Or, Hey, I'm feeling tempted to scroll around right now. Or, Hey, listen, I'm feeling really entitled. I'm about to go home. Would you pray for me to not be a jerk to my family when I get there or whatever it may be? We, we acknowledge how we're being tempted and that helps to get light. So light is since kryptonite. And when you get light on, on it, it helps to wither its strength and you're able to endure. And that, so that for me, you mentioned a verse earlier, first Corinthians 10, 13, that, uh, you know, no temptation is overtaking you such as common to man and God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're, be, you're able, but with the temptation provide a way of escape. So you'd be able to stand up under it. That way of escape I have found begins with acknowledging the temptation. So when the temptation comes, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to fight it. And if I give in, I'm going to talk to somebody. But it's, hey, listen, hey, I'm feeling tempted right now. Would you pray for me? That helps That helps so often just to shoo away the tempter and to, yeah, to just strengthen me to, 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 to fight. And then if I do sin, if I do compromise, um, I need to come and, and confess and confess honestly. So there's a big difference in your confessions of coming to somebody and saying, hey, listen, um, hey, you know, I, I struggled with uh, I struggled with some purity stuff uh, recently, but, uh, you know, doing better now. So but just pray for me. That is very different than last night I was on my phone and I opened up an app and I knew that I could probably access something. And I started scrolling around and I was intentionally hoping to see something erotic. And I did. And I saw some sensual pictures. I saw some nudity and I lingered and then I deleted the app and then I downloaded it again and I did it again for another 15 minutes. And then I masturbated and I'm, I'm, I sinned. Those two things mm. are totally different. Yeah. One is deceitful and one is true. I noticed in my true confessions, I didn't tell you what website I didn't tell you all that because I didn't want to tempt you, but I, we need to learn to walk in the light and our pride and our, you know, shame, guilt, all of that kind of stuff. We just got to put that to death or sin will be too strong. And you, it's just stronger than you, mm. but in the light, you're with Jesus and he will fight for you. Um, and so that kind of community um, is really, really helpful for me. Yeah, that's really, really good. Really, really an important thing. Well, how does embracing the throne of grace and having an eternal perspective help in our pursuit of purity? Man, it's it's the business. It's 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 the <laughs> answer. Right? I mean, it's there's there's no tactics, you know, as my uh, as a. Uh, uh, my um, spiritual life uh, professor said in seminary, there's no switch. Like you don't just, you know, flip a switch and you're, you're walking in the power. There's no pill for this. Like the answer is acknowledge your need and go to Jesus. So the throne of grace, as you refer to is uh, described specifically or explicitly in Hebrews chapter four, verses 14 through 16. We're talking about Jesus as our high priest, who's the ascended one, who's interceding even now for us. And then there's this invitation that because we have this great high priest, come near to the throne of grace. So not the throne of condemnation, which is what we will face if we're apart from Christ. But if you're in Christ or the throne of grace, 
where you are, you, you come and you stand in this place of grace, as Romans 5, 1 says, right? We stand now in grace. And um, there he promises mercy to help us in our time of need. So what that does already is it has our eyes up. It has our eyes up on Jesus. And it has, that's where strength comes from, from beholding him. Second Corinthians 3, 18 says it's by beholding the Lord with unveiled face and seeing his glory that we are changed from one degree of glory to another. So it's by, by being fixated on Jesus and coming and saying, Lord, I am, I am weak. Second Corinthians 12 says that that's the Lord's like, he's like, I hear that. I'm going to give grace to that. Um, so Paul says, I'm going to boast all the more of my weaknesses. So boast before God of how much you need him. Yeah. And by doing that, your, your, your eyes are up, you're on him. He's always going to deliver everything he promises. He's not a God who promises and doesn't deliver, but he promises mercy. He promises grace. He will give it to you because he's not a liar. Now, that's not a quick fix. Hey, Lord, I'm struggling. Nope. Okay, I'm just going to give in. No, no, no. Stay there. Plead with, Lord, help me. Call somebody. Pray for me right now. I'm trying to pray. I'm trying to resist or I'm whatever it may be. Lord, help me. Come to the throne of grace, and 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 the throne of grace now is our help. And then it it it, it shows us the the grace of one day we'll see him by by sight. So faith will be no longer hope will be realized. And and by having that eternal perspective, that one day I'm going to be like him, I'm going to be with him and be like him. First John chapter three says that if that's our hope, that that purifies us now. That, yeah. that whoever has the hope of being pure like him then will purify themselves now. That's 1 John chapter 3, verse 3. And so, so even wanting to be like him has a purifying effect now. So the more that that day is on our radar, it will inform this day. And the more that you're thinking about um, of the fact that, that we're, we're going to give an account for everything that we've done in the body, as 2 Corinthians 5 says, that that matters, right? I mean, that's why, again, back to one of the questions you asked earlier about a, the, the enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil, that's why you never, in a TV show, hear them break in and say, oh, by the way, just an interruption, a friendly reminder that soon you will stand before a holy God and give an account for everything you thought, done, and said, and even watch tonight. Enjoy the rest of the show. Like you never hear that because the world does not want you thinking about things of eternity. When our heart is set on the things of God and our eternity with him, and that is our great joy, it it gives strength today to have sober eyes about what sin offers here. And it's going to make you want to resist that and to flee to him for the lasting pleasure and treasure that that sin cannot steal away. Mm, wonderful. Well, and, and going back to what you just said previously, um, I remember at a men's retreat, I was preaching and I said, you'd have to specifically apologize to your to your wife, you know, when you sin, not just excuse it, white, whitewash it, put it under the rug and say it didn't happen. But that's, that applies to our prayers. It, it applies to our confession. It applies to our prayers. Not not specifically apologizing, but getting specific with God mm-hmm. about what's happening in, in your life and getting specific with people, like you're saying, about mm-hmm. your sin, about your struggle, going to them, sharing with them honestly, authentically, real, real. You know, uh, Burke Parsons once said that uh, on Twitter, he said, I mean, the guy's a a gift, right? I mean, he just got away. He said that accountability is, you know, first and foremost, not a finger in your face, but an arm around your shoulder. That's and good. that is, that is just a beautiful picture of how we're supposed to, you know, bear each other's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 1. And uh, many, many others, it's a beautiful picture of the one another, 50, one another passages in the New Testament, just coming alongside of each other, not putting a finger in your face, because that finger should be pointed at ourselves first, yeah. not at not at the other person anyway. And uh, what you're saying is just so, so important about, about that. So I, I really think that that's, there's a lot of, lot that people need to chew on there about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, what advice do you have for the spouse of a, or, or friend of someone currently struggling with sexual sin for how to be supportive? Um, I know this is going to be, this is the answer you're expecting, but to begin with prayer. So you, you, you want to ask God to give you a heart to care about them. Um, in the same way he cares about them, which is mm-hmm. not going to be natural to us. So depending on, you know, if, if, if my spouse is struggling with pornography, it can be very easy for me, which I'm not saying she does. That's not her thing. But like if she were, it would be very easy for me to just make it horizontal. Like you've done wrong to me. You've done wrong to me, which is totally true. But we want to make we want to make things vertical first and foremost. So, Lord, help me to care about 
this person like you do. Mm. And if they've sinned against me, help me to first see it through the grid of, I know they've sinned first against you and you offer grace. So as you've offered grace to me, as I've sinned against you, help me to offer grace to them. So, you know, we want to speak the truth in love. Both are important. So yeah. sometimes we tend to either just be truth, like you need to quit your sinning, you know, or just love, like God loves you. There's grace. Well, speak the truth in love. So mm-hmm. we need we need both. And I would say I've been helped in my life by some very hard, um, pointed conversations that I've I've had with other people who have said very direct things to me about about my struggles with sin. And they have been hugely helpful. Um, so I've needed that sharpness. And then I've also needed, um, like, like, you know, like Burke said with a, an arm around and say, Hey, listen, but now let's together go to the throne of grace and get your help in, in, in a time in need. So, um, yeah, so the, you know, the, the scalpel hurts when it cuts, but, but the doctor is doing good work in a surgery. He's, he's, he's cutting to help you. So in the same way, we need to cut open and say, here's what it is. And now let's get some grace on there. So it's got to be a little bit of both. So we want to pray. We want to speak the truth in, in love and then just take the long view. People don't change quickly. Just remember mm-hmm. how slow you are to change. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean you need to excuse sin, mm-hmm. but you need to be patient with sinners. I mean, Jesus sure puts up with us for a lot. You know I mean? Like think about <laughs> how patient he is with us. May that inform. I mean, that seems to be what's behind, you know, Matthew 18 with the unforgiving servant, but the King's like, you got forgiven so much. And now you out choking people out over a little bit. I think, I think we're to see that and to remember, yes, that's true with forgiveness. It's also true with the way we minister to people yeah. to take the long view, be patient, to be tender, yeah. and to realize that the Lord is the one who's going to ultimately change people. It's not us. So um, asking God to intervene and um, yeah, keep, keep pointing toward heaven. Yeah, that's really good. I, what you're talking about is what one of my mentors calls uh, seeing people through the lens of the good shepherd. You know, seeing them as as bought by Christ, yeah, made in good. the image of God. Um, and, you know, like you said, we don't assume anybody's a Christian, but we're seeing them through the lens of how Jesus sees them either. You know, if they're if they're lost, they need the gospel. If they're saved, then they need you know, they still need the gospel either way. But we're seeing them through the lens of how, you know, from a biblical worldview through the eyes of Christ. And that's uh, so I mean, that what that does for me, it's helped me to slow down, uh, not to be more patient. Uh, to be more understanding, to to see people as as God sees them through Christ, and uh, that's that's uh, and I'm, I'm not I'm not I, I haven't arrived in that at all. Uh, okay. I never will. You know, some of the hardest things in, in ministering to people, even people, tough people, difficult people, is just that. It's like taking a pause and realizing what you just said about perspective and patience and gentleness and and all of that. It's all strategies that you have to have in place well before you you. Even even uh, get to that point where you're talking to them and it starts really with, with yourself, you know, who are you, you know, and who are you in Christ and, you know, being aware of that and, and all of those things are just so, so important. So yeah, yeah, that's a good word. Yeah. At, at what point uh, should somebody enslaved to pornography seek out biblical counseling from their pastor or biblical counselor? Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, what, what, what do we mean by biblical counselor, all that kind of stuff. So um, I think first thing you want to, you want to you want to start with being making sure you're being honest with the the people who are around you. So, uh, biblical counseling is is a form of discipling. So it's it's not like these you know there's these you know Yodas who are you know the the super spiritual ones who have all the answers. There certainly are people who are gifted. We have people in our church who are very gifted in in, in applying the gospel to brokenness and call it biblical counseling. I I get that, but I just want to I want to demystify it just a little bit. I, th- I think we want to start with. Are you being honest and do you have people around you and are they helping you? And if, if with that help, we're still seeing some real um, struggles or we're, we're seeing some things that need to be unpacked to go deeper. I certainly think involving a pastor initially and saying, Hey, um, I think that's important as pastors, we are shepherds overseeing people's souls. So I think it's helpful for us to know, Hey, one of your sheep is struggling in this particular way. These are the things that's coming out and they may be able to help uh, in, in real pointed, clear ways, or they may be able to say, you know what, this sounds like something that I think um, somebody who's really gifted and trained um, yeah, to help unpack some of these underlying contributing issues. Um, yeah, let's, let's, let's then find somebody to, to do that. Just want to be slow to outsource stuff. I just think the spirit of God, the word of God, and the people of God can do a lot of good work. Um, 
again, not minimizing the fact that there's experts in different fields and all that kind of stuff. But um, I, I do think that um, when, when the pattern becomes clear that that, that real uh, progress is being stunted, um, or if there's uh, real issues being exposed that that need some some real yeah, expertise in regards to to unpacking, then I think it would be a good time to to draw draw a counselor in for sure. Yeah, that's a that's a good word. Per, that's very well said. You know, Garrett, where can people go to find out more about your work online, either on social media or otherwise? Um, yeah, so I I do I am on social media. Um, I'm on uh, let's see, I'm on Twitter uh, at uh, Pastor J G Kell. Um, it's a yeah, it's a mix of uh, entertainment and edification. So um, mm. try to always be edifying, but uh, yeah, a little bit of that. And then um, I mean, normal Facebook stuff, and then. Um, Instagram, I don't use much, uh, kind of on and off of, of, of there. Um, but if I do use that, it's a J dot Garrett dot Kel. And then uh, I have a blog that I don't really use as much anymore. Uh, all things for good. I'll, I'll post on there occasionally. Um, but I'm, I'm about to, uh, put links to all of the other articles. So I've written stuff for, yeah, uh, TGC, Nine Marks, Desiring God uh, for the Church, some other other folks like that. Um, so Crossway, and you, you can check those uh, those resources out. So um, mm-hmm. uh, the Pure in Heart book, I think, is supposed to come out in in July, and then um, I have two other little resources. One is um, How Can I Find Someone to Disciple Me? It's in the Nine Marks Question Series. That was really a joy for me to put together. It's it's not so much how do you help other people follow Jesus, but it, if you want help um, in in following Jesus, how do you find somebody to pour into you? And then the other one. One is uh, do I have to go to church? It's part of a little series um, that Nine Marks and Twenty Schemes put together. That's aimed at people who don't have kind of a church background. It helps you through through what is the church and why is it an important part of the, the Christian's life. So those might be helpful resources as well. What wonderful, wonderful brother! You know, there's a lot that we could really talk about, and we've only really scratched the surface. So you know, as we uh, wrap up here today, Garrett, uh, do you have a few takeaways for our listeners or those watching this? Man, I, I would just say to remember that Jesus is, he is it. his promises. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. That is, that is a, a promise to tuck in your heart that I come back to all the time. Even when I feel tempted, I'm like the pure in heart, see God. I want to see you, God, help me to help me to want to see you. So I would, I would just want you to know that there's power in God's promises. There's also power uh, by his spirit in this life to help you to resist sin and temptation. And I would also say that if, if you've heard this and and, and maybe even that part when we talked about what a confession looks like and you've been convicted at all uh, about sin, don't yeah, don't grieve the spirit or quench the spirit by tucking that down. But begin even now, send a text, drop an email to somebody saying, hey, I need to talk about something. And uh, yeah, begin that that journey of being honest and, and stepping into the light. Um, it, it may be costly, but it will cost more to not do it. So cling to Jesus. He will be with you. He, he promises that he will. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, really good, Garrett. Well, guys, we've been talking with Garrett Kell today about his new book, Pure in Heart, Sexual Sin, and The Promises of God. Garrett, it's been a pleasure to talk with you and get to know you a little bit better. Uh, may God bless you and, and richly uh, bless your ministry, brother. Appreciate you, Dave. Same to you. God bless Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.